morning. morning. It's great to be here this morning. I want to thank your pastor, VJ VG, um, for giving me the honor to address you this morning. Um, he is a very brave man because this Indian pastor has let this American pastor come and take over his pulpit. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Emmanuel said, uh, Jessica and I have been friends with the Poppins for some time now. And uh, this is now our third time to India visiting with them. Emmanuel told me that you are doing a series on prayer. And he had said that last week you went over some of the theology of prayer and looked at personal prayer. And he asked me to talk a little bit about community prayer. And as I thought about community prayer, my mind went to the prayer that King Solomon offered at the dedication of the temple. And that's found in 1 Kings chapter 8. So if you happen to have a Bible on you, or you have a way to read the Bible on your phone, uh, I'd invite you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. Before we get into God's Word, it might be good if we say a prayer. So let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that you are a God who loves us so much that you do not remain hidden, but you reveal yourself to us in your word. Your word is our authority, our guide in life. So as we come to learn from you, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our hands to receive all that you have to teach us from your word this morning. Amen. How many people here have been to a building dedication where there was something new built and they were dedicating it? These events can be pretty important events. Uh, in my own country, America, in 1931, they were doing the building dedication for the Empire State Building. And the then President Hoover pressed the button that symbolically represented uh, the lights being turned on. The reality was somebody was actually flicking the switch in New York City. But it was an important event and he hit the button. Uh, in 2010 in the United Arab, Arab Emirates, uh, the tallest building in the world, the Burger Khalifa, when that building was being dedicated, they did pyrotechnics, there was a light show, there were fountains that were choreographed. It was a big deal. Here in India, you might remember the opening of the Lulu Mall or the Kochi Metro and the ribbon cutting at those events. Uh, these events can be very significant and very important for a community. In our passage this morning in 1 Kings, we come to a building dedication. And it's the dedication of the temple that Solomon built. And at this dedication, Solomon doesn't celebrate the achievements of humanity. Instead, he points to God in a fairly lengthy prayer that is recorded to us, or for us, in 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 22. And this is how Solomon starts his prayer. Verse 22, and he said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servant who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Solomon begins by saying, there is no God like you, you who keep your covenant love with your servants. There is no God like you who keeps 
your covenant of love with your servants. We probably have heard that word covenant many times. It's something that occurs frequently in the Bible. But what does it really mean? Is there some modern word that we could use to explain what a biblical covenant was? We could use the word contract. And yes, in a sense, a covenant was legally, just as legally binding as a contract. However, usually when we think about a contract, we're thinking about two parties coming together, but they're looking after their own interests. That's really what they're looking at. So co contract is helpful in thinking about a covenant in that it's binding. However, a covenant seems to be even more than just a contract. It's not quite as legalistic. It's not quite as calculating. We could use relationship. And yes, a covenant was a very relational thing. It was about relationship. However, some relationships, like maybe a friendship, they can end. And they can end without a whole lot of things changing besides maybe some hurt feelings. So a covenant has to be more than a relationship. But if we think of contract, and we think of relationship, and we put them together, we begin to get an understanding of what a biblical covenant is. A biblical covenant is something that is just as binding as a contract, but just as personal and loving as a relationship. And Solomon begins his prayer by saying that our God is a God who keeps his covenant with us, no matter what. And Solomon uses this word that's translated love in our English Bibles. And it's actually a Hebrew word, it's chesed. And if you only knew one Hebrew word in your whole life, this would probably be the word that's worth knowing. So why don't you turn to the person on your right and just say, God's love is chesed. Now turn to the person on your left and say, God's love is chesed. Congratulations, you all know a little bit of Hebrew. What does this word mean? This word means that God's love for us, his, its covenant love is loyal. Oftentimes when we see the word covenant, it often is accompanied by this word chesed. God's love, love is loyal, it's never-ending, it can always be counted on, even when we're unfaithful to God, He remains faithful to us. So in all of our prayers, we want to begin by recognizing that we believe in a covenant God who keeps His loyal love with us. However, Solomon has a specific reason to talk about God's faithfulness. It's not just an abstraction. It's not just something that's in the air. Something has actually happened in his life, in the life of his community, that has visibly shown them that God really is faithful. He really is a covenant God. And he says this in verse 24, we just read it, verse 24, you have kept your promises your promise to your servant David, my father. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. King David was the second king of Israel, and he was living in this beautiful house of cedar. And he was looking out of his beautiful house of cedar, and he saw the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this ornate made to move tent. It could be packed up and it could move over to somewhere else. And he was living in this beautiful house of cedar and he saw the tabernacle and he said, I need to build for the Lord something better than a tent. I want to build him a temple. And he was all ready to do just that. But then the prophet Nathan came to him and said, it's not for you to establish for me a house, to establish for me a temple. It's not for you to do that. But, he's, but 
the Lord speaking through Nathan said to him, but this is what I am going to do. I'm going to make sure that someone always sits on your throne. And also your offspring, your son, will build a temple. So when Solomon became king in place of his father David, he began gathering all the provisions, all the wood and the timber that he would need to build the temple. And he set out and he built the temple. He built the temple and the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Solomon had seen right before his eyes God's faithfulness. So in all of our prayers, in all the things that we pray to God for, we want to first start by saying, you are a faithful God. I can count on you, Lord. You created the heavens and the earth. You redeemed me in your Son, Jesus Christ. And whenever I come to you in prayer, I can know that you are a faithful God who keeps your covenant of love. And it's because of this faithfulness that we can pray about anything. There's nothing that we can't pray to the Lord about. And Solomon knew that. And what follows, starting in verse 27, going all the way through till you get to verse 51, are seven categories or situations where the people of God could pray. And we're going to go through these very quickly. I won't speak quickly, but we'll go through them quickly. Verse 27. Or actually, we're going to start with verse 31. Sorry, verse 31. Solomon says, When anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath, and they come and swear the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing them down on their heads what they have done, and vindicating the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. We could call this a prayer for justice. That's what Solomon's saying, is that whenever injustice comes, you can look to this temple and you can pray for justice to God. And think about it. Is there injustice anywhere in your community? Is there injustice? Are there people in your church community that are facing injustice in some way? Maybe in your own life, you yourself are facing some type of injustice. Know that you can pray for justice. So the first thing, the first situation is we pray for justice. In our prayers, we can pray for justice. Starting in verse 33, Solomon said, When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave to their ancestors. We no longer live on, under the law of Moses. For the law of Moses, when things would happen to them, they could pretty quickly go, well, maybe we did something wrong. For us, sometimes it's not quite as clear. However, for us, there are consequences to sin. There's consequences in our personal life. There's consequences in our family. There's consequences in our community. There's consequences in our society. Because we live in a sinful world, and because from time to time we sin, there are effects of our sin. And what we could call this is a prayer for rescue from the effects of sin, or a prayer for rescue from the consequences of sin. 
So we can pray to God and say, we've messed things up with our sin. If I need to ask for forgiveness from someone, show me, Lord. If I need to forgive somebody, give me the power to forgive them. If I need to make restitution because somehow someone lost something because of something I did that I should not have done, I can pray, Lord, rescue us from the effects of sin, from the consequences of sin. So we have, we can pray for justice, and we can pray for rescue from the effects of sin. Verse 35, Solomon says, When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain, because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Again, we no longer live under the law of Moses, so when things happen, we can't always make that assumption that it's because we did something wrong. But if we did, we can be sure the Lord will make that clear to us because he'd want to do that. He wouldn't leave us in the dark. But really what this is, is this is a prayer for provision. Because we need rain. We need the things that the Lord can give us. We can pray for provision. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray for, Lord, today, give us our daily bread. So we can pray for all the provisions we need, both personally and even as a community of God that's trying to reach out to our neighborhood. We can pray for all the provisions that we need to do that. So we have a prayer for justice, we have a prayer for rescue from the effect of sin, and we have a prayer for provision. Verse 37, when famine or plague come to the land or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading out their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. We can call this a prayer for deliverance. In our lives, in our ministry, in our community of ministry, we will face obstacles. We were just praying for the rights of missionaries. And there are obstacles that might come in our way when we are trying to do the work of the Lord. And we can pray for deliverance from those obstacles, that the Lord would move them away so that his word could go forth, so that people could hear the good news, so that people could be saved, that there would be healing, that there would be restoration in our communities. So Solomon prays for deliverance. So we have a prayer for justice, a prayer for rescue from the effect of sin, a prayer for provision, and a prayer for deliverance. You got it. Verse 41, we're going to skip a few verses for the sake of time. Verse 41, Solomon prays, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. The purpose of God blessing Israel was never for Israel to keep all those blessings for themselves. Israel was blessed to be a blessing to all nations. 
by blessing Israel, by allowing them to build this temple, all the nations around them would see their relationship with God. They would see the temple that was at the center of their community that represented that in some special way God was dwelling with these people. They would see the light of Israel and they would be attracted to the Lord God Almighty. So we could actually call this prayer on the other side of the cross, a prayer for evangelism. A prayer that in our community, that people would see Christ within us. That when they look at us, they would see the light of Christ. That we would be the salt of the earth. And that by our relationship with our Father in heaven, people would be attracted to God. So we could call this a prayer of evangelism. So we pray for justice, we pray for rescue from the effects of sin, we pray for provision, we pray for deliverance, we pray for evangelism. Verse 44, when your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea, and uphold their cause. Verse 44 again, when your people go to war against their enemies. Our enemies are no longer Canaanites or Philistines. Instead, our enemies are the rulers, the authorities, the powers in this dark world, the principalities in the heavenly realm. So we could call this a prayer for victory, because we pray that demonic strongholds would be broken we pray that um, sin and evil would be uh, extinguished from people's lives and that if there's anything keeping people from seeing the goodness and the sweetness of the Lord, that those things would be broken and that the things that are uh, the systematic sin in our society or the sin that is everywhere through our work would be lessened would be bent, would be curved. So we pray for victory. We put on the armor of God, we continue to pray. We pray for victory for the sake of Christ. So we pray for justice, we pray for rescue from the effect of sin, we pray for provision, we pray for deliverance, we pray for evangelism, we pray for victory. Yes, victory. All right, our last, so there's like seven categories here, and we're on our last one. So thanks for tracking so well. So we're on our last one here, but this one needs a little bit more explanation. Have you noticed that just about every prayer had to do with sin? Isn't that interesting? Usually at a building dedication, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of celebration. Solomon doesn't go there. He talks about how when sin comes, look to this temple. There's not as much celebration here as we might think. It's a very interesting thing. So before we go to this last category, I'm going to invite you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now Deuteronomy is considered by many scholars to be a collection of sermons that Moses delivered to the Israelites toward the end of his life as leadership was being passed from him to Joshua. So these were kind of Moses' final instructions to Israel before his death. And towards the end of Deuteronomy, Moses lists blessings and curses for following the law of Moses. And after he gets through these long lists of blessings and curses, in chapter 30, verse 1, he says this, When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. Look at those first words. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you. He's just listed all these blessings and curses. And then he says, 
They're going to happen. Not just the blessings, but the curses. They're going to happen. You are going to sin. You are going to be unfaithful. Yes, I am a faithful God, but you're going to be unfaithful. It's going to happen. And we go, what's the problem here? They've been giving all of these instructions. What's the problem here? Well, let's go to verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 30. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 17. But if your heart... But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, sin is an issue of the heart in the biblical sense of the word. In the biblical sense, the heart is not just the place of emotions, but it's the control center of the entire being where all of our emotions, all of our actions, where everything flows out of. It's kind of like the heart is the center of our circulatory system. It's the heart of everything that happens. Sin is an issue of the heart. Well, let's go to, back to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. This is the seventh prayer that Solomon makes, seventh situation. When they, the people of Israel, sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, <clears throat> who take them captive to their own lands far away or near. And if they have a change of heart, there's that word again. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. Forgive your people. Prayer, one of the reasons it's so important for us to pray and for a community to pray is it makes our heart align with the heart of God. God's heart becomes our heart when we make prayer a regular thing we do in our lives and in everything. So we pray for, we could call this a prayer for forgiveness. We pray for justice. We pray for rescue from the effect of our sin. We pray for provision, we pray for deliverance, we pray for evangelism, we pray for victory, we pray for forgiveness. Yes, we pray for forgiveness. This is not an exhaustive list of things you can pray for. In fact, the reason that seven may be recorded is to say that this is just a sampling. There's, you can pray for anything. And we could summarize the whole thing by saying this, in all things, at all times, pray to the Lord. In all things, at all times, pray to the Lord. <clears throat> if you would let me, I'd like to look at just one more verse. I know I didn't cover all the verses, but I want to look at one more, because I think it's so important. Verse 27. We'll backtrack a little. Verse 27. <clears throat> Solomon asked this question, and he says, But will God really dwell on earth? But will God really dwell on earth? And the simple answer is this, no. The highest mountain, the highest heaven, the biggest, grandest temple can hold God. He is too big for it. He will overwhelm it. The temple was just supposed to symbolically represent God's special presence. It was never meant to contain him. However, the temple was not only symbolic of God being present with them, it also pointed to somebody else. There would be a man named Jesus of Nazareth, and he'd be walking through Jerusalem, 
And he would say, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And what he meant was not the physical temple built by human hands. What he meant was the temple that was his body. And that when they crucified him, he would raise again from the dead in three days. It was this same Jesus who in the beginning of John's Gospel it says that the Word, the Word being the second person of the Trinity, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt, the Greek word, the Greek verb, could technically be translated tabernacle. He tabernacled with us. And then in the book of Revelation it says that in the new heaven and the new earth there will be no physical temple because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. If Solomon had confidence to lift all of his requests to the Lord in prayer because of the temple, how much greater confidence do we have in Jesus Christ who is the true tabernacle of God, who dwells in our midst, and we can go to in prayer. In all things, at all times, pray to the Lord. In all things and at all times, pray to the Lord. So how can we end a sermon on prayer? Well, I think we need to pray. So maybe one of those seven categories resonated with you. Maybe you identified with one of them. Maybe it was for justice, the effects of sin, deliverance, provision, evangelism, victory, or forgiveness. Whatever it is, why don't we enter into a time of prayer to lift those things up? And if it would be okay with you, Pastor, can we just pray those things out loud? Okay, you don't have to wait for anyone else. You know, two people can talk at the same time, pray at the same time. <laughs> Let us just pray. So we're going to enter into a time of prayer. Um, if you want to speak out loud, you can. If you want to speak quietly in your heart, you can. If more than two people want to pray out loud at the same time, it's okay. Because in all things and at all times, let's pray to the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you for dwelling among us and setting your tabernacle in our hearts. And uh, Lord, these days as we come to you in prayer, help us to uh, share this amazing news uh, to the people around us. Lord, we pray that you will give us the compassion that dwells in your heart. Compassion that can see people in all circumstances, in workplace, in our walking, in our in our all circumstances. Help us to see people the way you see and to share your good news. Help us, O oh Lord. with you we are able we are able to come and talk to you to lay down our burdens before you just that to know that you care that you care about all these things just to know that you would intervene on our behalf that you would give us justice that you would provide for us that you are that you are there to forgive us that you are there to enable us to do those things that you laid on our hearts for your kingdom Lord, we thank you, thank you, that you made this wonderful provision of prayer available to us. Thank you, Lord, 
that you have put things on our hearts to pray to for your kingdom. How wonderful that we can partner with you, that we can be a part of this amazing thing you're doing across the earth. Thank you, Lord, for all the things, every time you stood for us, every time you intervene on our behalf, you spoke spoken up for us. Thank you, Lord. You are such an awesome God and what a privilege. We have no words to thank you. We bless your holy name. And Lord, we pray, enable us, enable us to pray, pray, pray the prayers you lay on our hearts. Thank you, Lord. And as you lead us, we will follow and we will see more of your kingdom on earth. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, when you walked on this earth, when you, you saw that your temple was defiled uh, with the business of money lending and going on in the temple, you have thrown out all those things, Lord, with your, your anger has come upon uh, them and you have cleared the temple, Lord. Likewise, our heart may be defiled with certain desires which may be not acceptable to you. Lord, we pray that you may drive out all those evil things from our heart to make our heart your tabernacle, pure and clean, which will be honorable to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. transcendent, the God who is above all things, that we can speak to you. And then you show your love to us by dwelling among us. Although you are transcendent, that you are above all things, that you chose to come and rescue us and come and live among us and finally dwell in our hearts. Lord, what an amazing love. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you with all of our needs, all that we have to say, all that we, uh, that we think and, 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 and that is in our heart that we can come and bring that before you. We thank you for that privilege, but we also thank you that in prayer that we can come and listen to you, hear from you, receive direction in our life and even enjoy just things that, that even even about little things that you would speak about that we would hear and, and enjoy our relationship with you. Lord we thank you for Mike and Jessica. Thank you for the work that you're doing in and through them. Thank you for allowing them to bring your word to us so clearly. Lord, in the coming days, as we go from here, help us to uh, enjoy praying. Lord, we do not want this prayer as a task. Lord, at times the enemy has manipulated our minds to think that this prayer is something that is boring and, and, and a task and a chore that we have to do so we can get something or please you. 
But this is such a gift that you have given to us to enjoy you, to know you, and to make you know. So Lord, help us as a community of grace to be a people of prayer. So as we pray, people will see us and know that there is something different as you hope to see something different in the temple. But now as your presence dwell in us, as we continue to enjoy your presence through prayer, may others also come to know you, O oh Lord, and see this as this is a special community, as a church, not just community of grace, but all other churches in the city, that people will be drawn to people of prayer. So we again thank you for this great gift of prayer. Thank you for your covenant love that now that we know that in Christ we have a covenant love, a love that will not change. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, as a benediction, I want to say this. As children of God, may we enjoy God. All right? As an ambassadorial community, let us push back the darkness. Amen? As a church, let us build one another. Amen? Let's do this this week. Okay? All right. God bless you. And now we'll go into a time of enjoying food and fellowship. So, um, God bless you. <laughs>